Moat Court was started as a sculpture park about 12 years ago. And we are going to have our first one-man show. And we've chosen the work of Anthony Caro because when I was looking at volumes about him, I suddenly came across this group of work which has not been shown in this country. I think that Tony and Sheila, his wife, are one of the most amazing examples to us all as to how you can um, both be wonderful artists and live happily together. And I thought they'd be married over 50 years and it would be very nice to sort of celebrate this. I've always tried to avoid showing with Tony because I felt it was sort of taking some of his sort of reputation on my own shoulders, which I didn't want to do ever. I wanted to make my own way. But now it doesn't worry me. <laughs> I think he was thrilled to have them all out too. I like everything about Tony's work. Here, I, I love the way it relates to the landscape. Uh, I love the kind of rawness, the toughness. I love the juxtaposition. I like the way that it makes space. I like the way that it sits in the landscape. It works close up, it works from a distance. Uh, I'm a fan. Seeing his works today, sitting so sort of naturally, if you like, in this, yeah, very, very English corner of Wiltshire is, is really fantastic. And also that actually, I, it's really lovely to see his works in juxtaposition with Sheila's because I think they do have a dialogue, even though it's not a very obvious one. We talk a lot, an awful lot, about what we try to do in our work and, and about whether we should make something simpler or whether we should um, put more in it or more figuration or less and so on. So, so there is conversation between us and I think there's conversation between these paintings and my sculptures. Roach Court is where my husband and I lived, and he f used to farm. And then in the true tradition of farming going down the tubes, we decided to diversify. And I had a gallery in London for many years, and it was his idea to bring the whole New Art Centre down to the country. And the idea is to have a sculpture from the 1950s onwards, so that anybody who comes here can get an idea of the progression of sculpture in this country and abroad for the last 50, 60 years. Up till now, we have not had one-man shows because we've always felt it was important to have a wide group of work for people to see when they came here. But now, with Tony, this is an experiment, and I think it's going to be extraordinary. I think it's difficult to overstate just how important Anthony Caro is, uh, both as an artist and as a, a sculptor. Um, there are very few artists who rewrite the rules, and uh, I think that's what Tony Caro did. The tradition of sculpture, which was obsessed with the figure and solid shapes and the human form, that's what sculpture had been doing for hundreds of years. And uh, Caro rewrote the, the rule book. He took all of that apart and produced an entirely different kind of sculpture, a sculpture about space, uh, using new materials. Uh, solidity was consigned to history, and he created a new kind of sculpture that was light and floating and airy. And from that moment onwards, sculpture has never really looked the same again, and Tony Caro is the man who started that process. I started painting them for protection. 
You can't leave steel because it's going to rust. So you put varnish on it, you paint, you do something like that with it. And they were brown, and then, why all this brown paint that I've got here? We, we must try and paint it, let's try painting it another colour, see what happens. And, you know, uh, I would get suggestions from Sheila, what colour shall I do it? Well, try, try this one, red, which red? Well, let's choose the red, you know? I mean, it was household paint, have a shot. And it has become an important aspect of the sculpture. Another change or breakthrough or something happened when I stopped colouring. And I felt that, in fact, to have coloured those later pieces would have been too decorative. I started using pieces of steel which had a decorative element to them because the ends would be bent or curved or something. Add a bit more colour to that and you over the top, you've, you've lost it. Because in a way, colour hits you hard. It doesn't last as long as form, but it hits you harder. I remember coming back from the States and seeing this Whitechapel <laughs> exhibition, which was, I mean, incredible. And those works, for me, they're still very powerful. They really resonate, you know. And I can see all the links and the connections, how, you know, he's moved from there and this kind of dissolve between Tony as a sculptor, his interest in the engineering, the fabrication, the materials, his interest in architecture and making spaces and so on. As architects, you're making, amongst other things, sculptural uh, statements in space. And, you know, and, and Tony as a sculptor is also creating uh, spaces that you can walk into. But, you know, this guy's a, a great sculptor. There are little places for kids to go and sit. And I imagine you're playing hide and seek around those things or whatever it is. So in a way, yes, it could be big in the hole, but the detail is kind of a very human size, I think. Everybody should have a studio. Everybody should have a real studio or a studio in their head or some place, I was going to say, which is home. And you make it fit around you in the end. I mean, uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's a room or a garage or a big space like this. It, it, it's just, it's yours. It belongs to the person you are. These are niches, of which there are nine of these in the church. And these are the details of, of this. So this bit, this is this. This is this, you see. Each one has got its own separate measurement. And I've got to work to this measurement. Um, so, you know, that was, this is number one. This is number two, I think, or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, there is a difference of, of size, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, is there a difference of arch in these cases? In yeah, this case, the, everything's The different. arch is different too. Yeah. yeah. Well, this model is one-tenth of the size of the, of the choir of um, Saint Jean-Baptiste Church in Bourbourg the area that I have. In the war, an English fighter pilot, I think it was, had his plane was on fire and instead of landing in the town where he would have killed a lot of people, he landed on the church roof and it, it caught fire. And he was killed. And of course, it was repaired, but only just to make it waterproof. And um, it stayed like that, empty and rough for 60 years until they came along and they said to me, do you want to fill it with your, in your own way? And I decided I would like to make it a place of meditation and repose. 
and tranquility. But I am also keen that people from outside who are not necessarily churchgoers come in as well. So there'll be a door which I'm working on and outside uh, there will be uh, a, a sculptural thing to invite people in. Hopefully, people will go in there and they will sit down for a while or walk around and I want them to be touched. Maybe they come out smiling, maybe they go away and they say I must go again and they come back. It's... You're lucky if any of those things happen. Did you ask Sheila these questions? <laughs> <laughs> You know, whatever you do, if you were a sportsman or anything, it, it, it takes up your life, you know. But it's better than making money, because in the end, what have you got? You do have a thrill, I'm sure, if you've made a, made a pile that day or whatever it is. But I get a thrill when I've made one of these. Oddly enough, um, not looking at it so much later, but the, the making of it is is a tremendous bang. The making of it is, is wonderful. Well, I'm going to put a white ground down on, on that piece of canvas. No, I want to choose a big... I put these on with a good window cleaning stuff. But it's a slow process, my painting. It's not a one-shot painting because um, I do a lot of collage. So I do a, a ground first and slowly build up and you can move the collage before you stick it down, of course, wherever you want it so that you can go back into a painting and redo it, and uh, it, it's quite a slow process, really. Well, it's so fluid, this paint, and I couldn't move it about like this if I had it upright, because the whole thing would just run off. I mean, it's gorgeous stuff, isn't it? It's sort of so squadgy and... <laughs> In that painting, The Last Supper, the dark, the brown behind is uh, stained. And the stain picks up on the, um, the ridges of this tool and I'd made them vertical th so that I would do that. And so that I'd get vertical lines going down. And then you stain over it and you get that lovely um, quality, you know? The Last Supper, we went uh, into this chapel with Leonardo at the bottom and we were all by ourselves and we walked into the chapel at the very end and I just saw this as an abstract and I thought how marvellous with those colours spraying across the middle and the white cloth and um, I mean that was the first sort of idea of that but of course things evolve all the time, you know, you, it's like cooking almost. I began to paint um, professionally in the 70s, but I did um, stop for a while to uh, rear two boys. But I mean, I kept going with small paintings and watercolours a lot because it was an easy medium. But um, of course, I used to help Tony a lot. I used to, in those days, choose the colours and paint his sculpture. <laughs> Thank goodness I don't do that now. <laughs> I'm totally concerned in a way with colour. I mean, my chief concern when I start a painting is to choose the colours. And if I don't get the colours first, it's always a failure.
it's such a sort of sensory thing that it's hard to put it into um, words, really. Just what you do. <laughs> I often think when I look at the other works of art, I wish I could do that. But you know you couldn't. You, you just do what you can do, really. Otherwise, it wouldn't be honest, you know? I received a phone call from Tony Caro, and he said to me that he had planned to spend his summer in Toronto yeah. making a sculpture for York University. And I had a friend who had a factory for assembling bridges, and I phoned him and I said, can I rent a 100-ton crane, please? And an operator, and a couple of men on the ground. And uh, he said, well, these are the terms, David. And I said, we need one of your factory. We won't touch any of your bridges, but if you have some end pieces of steel or whatever you have laying around, we want to be able to go around and select it. Will you let us do that? And he gave us run of the factory, and uh, I went back to Tony and I said, come this summer, but don't make one piece. Make a few. We've got this crane, and uh, go ahead and use it. We set up a pad to work on. On that pad, we could make up to four sculptures. So nothing stayed on that pad for more than four days. So you'd get the steel, put it up like this, tack it in this position, put a strut to hold it up, add a piece, add another piece. No editing, just doing. And then get it off the pad, and after, when I went away, it would be welded up so that it was firm and strong. But it was a very quick and spontaneous way of working, and it was very helpful to me to learn how to not bother something. You don't go in with any purpose really in mind, rather than seeing, let's explore this stuff which you don't know about, and you're going to find out about. And I mean, in that case, I learned about that steel from the people I was working with, from the crane driver. I said to Red, the crane driver, what shall I do? He'd never seen a sculpture in his life before. And I said, what shall I do, Red? It's not right. Well, how about turning it on its side? Now you turn on its side something three times. I, you know, and we did it in 10 minutes. So that's how you get to learn about these things. I came out a few times to look and I knew they were exhausted. Every night they came back. So there was this level of excitement because everything was a discovery. Here was a, a, a sculptor who had made metal look like it could float, and suddenly he was taking it and he was making it into something entirely different from anything we'd ever expected. And there was an opportunity for great variety, and some of the pieces hugged the ground, some of them rose up, some of them stuck out in awkward ways, and some of them have an enormous sense of motion to them, of speed. And Tony has found originality in each individual piece, and uh, I think that that's part of uh, the excitement, that you never quite know from having seen the one what you're going to see in the next one. I think looking around the, the grounds and seeing these sculptures one after another, the predominant impression is one of, of surprise. One comes upon them and thinks, you know, is, is this, can this function as, as sculpture? It's, it's still unfamiliar. I think we're still coming to terms with them. They adopt a new language of flat, heavy uh, sheet steel that he rips and tears and 
he, what's remarkable about them is he uses the sculpture like uh, a painter would use uh, his materials, his paint. He lays one layer on top of another and he makes the steel look exquisitely light, uh, almost like leaves being placed one on top of the other. But throughout the activity, there is this flatness, which is a remarkable development in sculpture. When sculpture is so much uh, thought of as being to do with solidity and mass, here you have sculpture that is flat, almost like playing cards. It's a completely different way of looking at making a sculpture. very flat, simple, in-your-face pieces. They were not about subtlety. They were not really even about shape. They were about making that thing mean something. And in fact, a lot of people have never, uh, didn't find them at all easy at the beginning. Not at all easy. I mean, this now, what are we in 2007? It's the first time a group of them have been shown in England. I like Rochecourt's garden very much. I think it'll be very nice. And I don't like sculpturing gardens very much, but that is a particularly good one. And I would like very much to see them beside Sheila's paintings, which I've never seen them in close proximity. And they've chosen, uh, Sheila and Madeline have chosen sort of paintings which have the same spirit. So that will be nice. That will all be nice. The thing I think about Sheena is that theories and isms are never the essential part of her work. In fact, it's the real, the everyday, uh, the small things that she observes in the world that um, actually are the stimulus of her painting. She's not an intellectual painter, and that doesn't mean to say she doesn't bring intellect to her work, but it's not the starting point. I think that this series, the wall series, is quite exemplary of her work as a whole. She's exploring the two-dimensionality of the canvas. They're quite formal works in their exploration of space. Um, she's using collage to um, create a layering effect, but she's also bringing us back to themes of windows and doors and apertures and liminal spaces. So she's playing with um, the notion of painting as sort of a window onto the world, and yet at the same time she's refuting any possibility of painting being a window onto the world, because often the windows, those spaces are blacked out. They negate the possibility of sight. And they're quite intriguing works, and I think it's wonderful to see them in this space. And obviously here you've got a, a combination of sort of modern architecture and very old buildings, and, and this is something that she explores in a tactile manner in her paintings with her use of sort of pumice gel. And, um, and she uses, you know, so she's constantly sort of exploring the surface and texture, and you almost want to touch the paintings. They invite, they invite you in, but at the same time, um, they push you away. I mean, we see in um, the big painting, Way Through, which is sort of inviting you up there, but then there's nowhere to go. Painting, it's so unverbal. I'm always amazed when you get a critic writing about them, what they've seen that I ever knew I'd done, you know? <laughs> and it's very nice, actually, but uh, that they actually can see all that in a painting. But it's not about a story, it's about vision, really. It's about what I see. I don't do stories, I just do vision. Sheila's work comes up very much out of her felt and lived life, and that somehow feeds back into Tony's work, I think. And so I think it's very moving to see this collaboration here. I felt they went with the pictures. He is the most supportive critic of her work, and, and she of him too. So it's not like, oh, well, you know, the architectural spaces. It is more subtle than that, of two people who have, you know, an emotional, intellectual and aesthetic relationship that has gone on for half a century, nearly. 
between them. Very much a working relationship, you know. We, um, we've thrown ideas about all our lives, really, all our married lives. We've been married 57 years. I took her drawing board. I thought they were all just anybody's, and it was hers. So I suggested we went and talked about it. We've been talking about it ever since. <laughs> our studios are very close, and our conversations are very close. And, you know, I'll come over to Sheila's studio and say, I've done something, you've just got to see it before you go home, you know. And she'd come and have a look, and she'll point to the very bit that was a problem for me and say, that's a problem, or whatever it is. And we talk about art an awful lot. We're very boring. Uh, our, our, our lives are art. And, and, and so somehow it's rather nice to have a the celebration that we've got the show together, you know. So that will be nice. That will all be nice. But I'm not terribly interested in my old work. I'm more interested in my new work. What I'm going to make tomorrow is much more interesting than what I made yesterday. <laughs>